You're very welcome. This is The Beautiful Truth with Fintan Dunn on the 4th of October 2021. And we're going to take a look at Patrick Pierce's words, his wise words to the Irish people about the education system. And I've done an extract of an article which Pierce wrote back in 1916, the year he died. In fact, months before he died, he wrote this pamphlet. Uh, but the original article appeared three years earlier in 1913. Pierce, an extraordinary man, it seems we lost someone who was uh, not just the first president of Ireland, but the true visionary whose vision we have carried on without. Let me just give you an example from Pierce. He says we're entranced by the conception of education as some sort of a manufacturing process. Our children are the raw material, educated by modern efficient methods. We speak of the efficiency and the up-to-dateness of an education system, just as we speak of the efficiency and up-to-dateness of a system of manufacturing gas. We send our youth, he said, to the university to be finished. When finished, they are turned out after specialists grind them for the bureaucracy and the professions, not forgetting the debris ejected by the machine as either too hard or too soft to be moulded to the pattern required by the civil service or the law society. There is involved, he wrote, a primary blunder as to the nature and function of education, for education has not to do with the manufacture of things, but with fostering the growth of things. And the conditions we should strive to bring about are not the conditions favourable to rapid and cheap manufacture, but the conditions favourable to the growth of living organisms the liberty and the light and the gladness of a ploughed field under the spring sunshine. A vision indeed. I'll go on. He says, in particular, I would urge that the school system of the future should give freedom, freedom to the individual school, freedom to the individual teacher, freedom as far as may be to the individual pupil. This was indeed a radical vision which Pierce was expressing in 1913 originally. And he saw this principle of subsidiarity as applying strongly in education. No more top-down curriculum determined by a small group of people, but instead an education system focused on the individual child and their needs bottom up. Let's go on. To the old Irish, the teacher was Ache, fosterer. The pupil was Dalta, foster child. And the system was octus, fosterage, uh, words which we still retain as ida, dalta and idocus. And is it not the precise aim of education to foster, not to indoctrinate, to conduct through a series of studies, but first and last to foster the elements of character native to a soul, to help to bring these to full perfection rather than implant exotic excellences. And he hearkened after a system which was based on the original craft system. He felt that individual teachers should have a craftsman's responsibility towards students who study the craft, one which maintained over time and not one which was interrupted by movements from class to class to class on a manufacturing production line system, but a personal relationship between pupil and teacher. Philosophy, he wrote, was not in times of old crammed out of textbooks what was learned at the knee of some great philosopher. Art was learned in the studio of some master artist, a craft in the workshop of some master craftsman, and always it was the personality of the master that made the school, never the state that built it of brick and mortar, drew up the code of rules to govern it and sent hirelings into it to carry out its decrees. It seems to me, wrote Pierce, that there's been nothing nobler in the history of education than this development of the old Irish plan of fosterage under a Christian rule, when to the pagan ideals of strength and truth were added the Christian ideals of love and humility. What a statement, folks. There is a statement from Patrick Pierce, the first ever president of Ireland, which reconciled Ireland's pagan tradition with the incoming Christian traditions. And he took the best from both. He was there praising pagan ideals of strength and truth and the Christian ideals of love and humility. 
And what did we get? Unfortunately, with his execution, we got a descent into the very worst of reactionary Catholicism, a fascist kind of Catholicism, which rejected all else but its own teachings. And this balance between old and new, which Pierce was aware of, our first president, has been lost to history, folks, completely. But let's continue on with Pierce and his vision. Remember, says Pierce, that this ancient Irish system was not an education system of an aristocracy, but the education system of a people. It was more democratic than any education system in the world today. Our very divisions into primary, secondary and university crystallise a snobbishness, partly intellectual and partly social. At Clonard, Ciaran, the son of a carpenter, sat in the same class as Colum Kill, the son of a king. Pierce there arguing for the elimination of the social structures in our current education system and the very divisions which are within it. Uh, going on, he speaks of freedom and, and he reminds us the word freedom is no longer understood in Ireland. He says we have no experience of the thing, we have lost our conception of the idea. So completely is it true that the very organisations which exist in Ireland to champion freedom show no disposition themselves to accord freedom. They challenge a great tyranny, but they erect little tyrannies. Thou shalt not is half the law of Ireland, and the other half is thou must. Nowhere so rigorous as in the schoolroom. There has been and there is no freedom in Irish education. No freedom for the child, no freedom for the teacher, no freedom for the school. A sheer denial of the right of the individual to grow in his own natural way, bound hand and foot chained mind and soul, constricted mentally and physical with the involuted folds of rules and regulations, its programmes, its minutes, its reports and special reports, its pains and its penalties. Every school must conform to a type, and what a type! Charles Chaplin made the same point visually, didn't he? Displaying himself as caught in the cogs of the machine. This is what Pierce was arguing against as well, that we need to triumph over machinery. Now, don't get me wrong, there have been some advances. For example, there's no comparison between the world of exploration and learning that a young child experiences today in coming to education compared to 30 years ago. But unfortunately, the closer and closer you come to that moment of entering the workforce, the more and more the impositions of a mechanised system begin to impose themselves on that original free, uh, free ideal, which uh, is seen in primary level education. And so we lose that. We lose that and still have lost that. A teacher, wrote Pierce, is not yet in practice at liberty to seek and discover the individual bents of his pupils, the hidden talent that is in every normal soul, to discover and cherish. I knew one boy of whom his father said to me, he's no good at books, he's no good at work, he's good at nothing but playing the tin whistle. What am I to do with him? I shocked the worthy man by replying, though it really was the obvious thing to reply, buy a tin whistle for him. And that problem of how we treat the one with the special talents just emphasises the smaller problem in how we neglect to develop the full talents. As Pierce went on to say, precisely the same textbooks in every secondary school and college will constitute the whole problem of secondary schools. So therefore, the first thing I plead for is freedom for each school to shape its own programme in conformity with the circumstances of the school as to place, size, personnel and so on. Freedom again for the individual teacher to impart something of his own personality to his work, to bring his own particular gifts to the services of his pupil, to be in short a teacher, a master, one having an intimate and permanent relationship with his pupils and not a mere part of the educational machine, a mere cog in the wheel. Freedom finally for the individual pupil and scope for his development within the school. And I would promote this very idea of freedom by the organisation of the school itself, giving a certain autonomy, not only to the school, but to particular parts of the school, to the staff, of course, but also the pupils and at a large school, various subdivisions of the pupils. I do not plead for anarchy. I pre plead for freedom within the law, for liberty, not licence, for that true freedom which can exist only where there is discipline, 
which exists in fact because each valuing his own freedom respects also the freedom of others. And respect for the freedom of others is difficult now, isn't it? I mean, not alone can we not get that respect for the freedom of others in schools in terms of fostering individual talent. We can't even allow people to make their own medical decisions. That too is imposed top down in our structure. Truly, we lost a great visionary when we lost Pierce. So he argues for well-trained, well-paid teachers, well-equipped and beautiful schools and a fund at the disposal of each school to enable it to award its own tests based on its own programmes. These will be among the characteristics of a new system. It's a wonderful vision and one which we have singularly failed to accomplish. The final dream, the final frontier was in this last sentence towards the end and the internal organization little child republics with their own laws and leaders their fostering of individualities yet never at the expense of the commonwealth their care for the body as well as the mind what a vision little child republics with their own laws and leaders that was a conception of freedom in education and freedom in childhood. And it's a terrible shame we have lost it. And it's a terrible shame we lost him. We lost one of the great leaders which could have shaped a new Ireland when we lost Patrick Pierce. But how does that uh, noble vision um, play today? And to check that, I, I gave this vision as it is there to uh, an ex-teacher who has experience teaching just to see the reaction and and i'll bring you that reaction this is from a practicing teacher who's been there on the front line i've taught adhd dyslexic interested and non-interested those who are naturally quiet and those who are quite flamboyant gay straight transgender from very wealthy to those who hadn't a red cent and probably more that I don't even know about. I found every, and I mean every student, to have their own individual way of learning. And there is no one way that suits all. So as a teacher, you need to adapt to make it interesting, transform your own individual style of teaching to the student's way of learning. Whatever way they find it easier to learn, that is the best way to teach. If your heart is in your work and your student's education, you can always find a way. But not all people are born to teach even though they choose it as a career. But I do understand that the education system is trying to generalize a teaching regime of one size fits all. But in the end, it is up to the individual teachers to do their best to help make the cap fit as best they can. Anyhow, there's a practical assessment of it, sort of backing um, the core issues there that Pierce was raising. And it's a shame that teachers should have to struggle to try and inject that individuality and to bring out the best in pupils against the flow of the education system rather than with the flow of an education system. There are certain benefits, it has to be said, to mass production of any kind in terms of efficiency. Clearly there are losses as well. And when the machine itself starts to take over, you've got to question what you're up to, don't you? I think that questioning began at the founding of this state with Patrick Pierce and that it's a vision we need to return to. And the article, The Murder Machine, the modern version of Pierce's original Murder Machine article, uh, is on breakfornews.com and maybe you could circulate that and uh, just help to bring an awareness to people today that our country did have a different vision and a vision we haven't achieved and that this is the vision of our very first president. All right, that's it for this edition of The Beautiful Truth. I will be back with more soon. I hope you join me for that. And uh, in the meantime, this has been Fintan Dunn reporting. Thanks and see you soon.